Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on thequicklive.com. My name is Dr. Michelle DeMarzo. I am the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement in the Fairfield University Art Museum. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Katherine Schwab. Before I read a little bit of her biography, I, you may have seen on screen, if you are attending this live event for FYE credit, you'll need to take a quick screenshot of the event with the live chat underneath it and send it with your ID number to museum at fairfield.edu. And we will remind you about that at the end of the talk as well. Dr. Katherine Schwab received her BA from Scripps College, her MA from Southern Methodist University, and her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. She is, and get ready for this long series of titles, she is Professor of Art History and Visual Culture in the Department of Visual Performing Arts here at Fairfield. She is Director of the Classical Studies Program. She is Director of the School of Communication, Arts and Media in the College of Arts and Sciences. And if that were not enough, she is also Curator of the Plaster Cast Collection at the Fairfield University Art Museum. A specialist in ancient Greek art and archaeology, her research focuses on the Parthenon sculptural program, especially the Metopes. Scans of her Metope drawings are on permanent display in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. And the original drawings formed a traveling exhibition in the US from 2014 to 2018, organized by our museum. Her research extends to the Karyatid hairstyling project and the history of plaster casts. And she has been recognized for her contributions to Greek culture with the Helene of the Year Award by AHEPA District 7, the Connecticut and Rhode Island branch in 2011, followed by the Paideia Award for the State of Connecticut given by the University of Connecticut in 2012. Her drawings and photographs have also formed three separate exhibitions at the Greek Consulate General in New York City. And tonight she will be sharing her reflections on classical influences in the work of Ruby Sky Styler, um, using the exhibition Ruby Sky Styler Group Relief, which has recently opened in the museum's Walsh Gallery. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Katherine Schwab. Sorry, I have to. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, for hosting this afternoon's lecture or this evening's lecture, and for the very nice introduction. I'd also like to thank Carrie Weber, Executive Director of the Fairfield University Art Museum for bringing this exhibition of Ruby Sky Styler's work to Fairfield. Conversations about this uh, began some time ago. It's also a great pleasure, a particular pleasure to thank the artist Ruby Sky Styler and the guest curator Ian Berry of the Tang Museum at Skidmore College for such a beautiful and compelling exhibition and installation in our Walsh Gallery. To our students, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I'm so glad that many of you have already had the chance to visit the exhibition in the Walsh Gallery. To our audience from the West Coast all the way to Greece, Despite challenges of time zone, we are delighted that you can join us today. The voluptuous and languid form of this female figure leads me into the topic of today's lecture, classical influence, influences in the work of Ruby Sky Styler. Of course, this is but one means of gaining insight into Ruby's visual language. I will explore a few examples this afternoon in the time we have together. It is worth noting that in terms of archeology, span excavations usually don't reveal a complete object, let alone a whole building. Instead, one excavates and finds fragments uh, one reveals stratigraphy or levels, and one records absolutely everything. We have recovered approximately 3% of the material culture or finds from ancient Greece. That's a very modest amount, isn't it? This tells you how much we do not have. At the same time, fragments 
form pieces to a much larger image or picture and something that I often find in Ruby's work. When I first saw this sculpture, my immediate thought was a connection to a well-known image of sleeping Ariadne seen here in a Roman marble version in the Vatican collections. The same languid sleeping Ariadne was among a selection of plaster casts that formed a series, the Gazing Blue Ball series by Jeff Koons. The idea of using plaster casts of or with ancient sculpture is a practice that we can now date back to the fourth century BCE in ancient Greece. Today, one can find numerous plaster casts, cast collections throughout the world. We are very fortunate at Fairfield to have a beautiful collection of historic plaster casts, either on loan or gifted to us. Uh, by such uh, generous organizations as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, as well as other sources. In 2014, I had the pleasure of meeting Ruby Skye Styler when she visited our campus to see the plaster cast collection. She was preparing for a remarkable exhibition at the Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Art curated by Amy Smith Stewart. A view of her installation for Ghost Versions 2015, which you see in front of you, places our historic plaster casts on low platforms while Ruby's massive relief panels and plaster are displayed on the walls. For those of us fortunate enough to see this beautiful exhibition one of many aspects that stood out to me was this sense of a silent but direct communication between the historic cast representing ancient sculpture and Ruby's new work. From the figural to the relief, we begin to notice the layers of shapes and patterns in Ruby's work behind the cast of a boy. Closer still, more details emerge of patterns, textures, and letters suggesting fragments of words or language. It is as if a language is being spoken, but can we understand it? Ruby's exploration of the surface can be seen here in this outdoor sculpture, Bust of a Woman. When I first saw this sculpture, only through a photograph, it seemed familiar to me, perhaps recalling especially this lovely female figure of a maiden or core dedicated on the Athenian Acropolis by Euthydikos. I should note that we have a plaster cast of this maiden, which might explain why it is so familiar to me. Normally I see it every day that I teach in the museum classroom. Facial features, hair texture, while different, nevertheless seem to share a direct and bold gaze at the viewer. Ruby's image on the left, a head in profile, required a little more sleuthing, but surely its starting point is connected with the Apollo Piombino on the right. While the ancient bronze may have been a starting point for Ruby's transformation of the image, that Ruby's transformation of the image is entirely contemporary and fascinating as we look through layers, almost like a stratigraphy, to see the rather ephemeral image recalling the ancient bronze Apollo. And if you look really closely, you can see behind the profile image, there are words. Let's return to the exhibition in the Walsh Gallery. Starting with the sculpture, Male Head, 
In her September 10th conversation with Ian Barry, Ruby commented that she wanted to see just how far she could take, uh, how far she could go in reducing the image to its essential elements while still being able to support itself as a sculpture. The male head has multiple views from straight on and even reflected in the floor here in back view, in profile, where, which shows us the supporting element and again reflected on the floor, and even as a shadow on the low platform. One is rewarded by taking the time to walk around the sculpture. After all, it is a three-dimensional, it is three-dimensional and uh, beckons the viewer to consider all the angles. The essence of the form for a male head seems to me to be more than that. And I have a difficult time not seeing the connection to this ancient Greek bronze helmet. The helmet contours both define a male head and distill facial features to their minimum for recognition. In a similar vein, the vase with Sienna handles seems to capture the essence of a well-known ancient Greek vessel type called an amphora, which was originally designed in antiquity as a storage jar with a lid, very practical. Ruby's vase allows us to focus purely on the structure and the contours. It is both solid in its presence and wonderfully transparent. An ancient example is this amphora signed by Andocades as painter at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. On it in the scene, we see Heracles and Apollo in a struggle for the tripod, which is the symbol for the oracle of the oracle later famous at Delphi. We know the story and the outcome. Apollo will be victorious and it is his stunning sanctuary that we visit at Delphi today. An earlier amphora by Ruby from 2009 is rather large. I'm not certain about the exact height, but maybe three and a half feet. The neck, body and foot of the vase are covered in pieces or fragments drawn from or painted from Greek vase painting. I could probably spend quite a bit of time looking at it and trying to identify the source vases. As a side note, in some ways, this amphora conjures up the overwhelming sense that comes with studying for doctoral exams. A vase or pot has a habit of appearing in many of Ruby's works, part of her visual language that continues to look back and forward simultaneously. In this painting, frontal figure with pot, we have some themes I would like to touch on, including blocks of patterns that never exactly repeat, letters, a vase, and a figure made of fragments painted transparently to reveal more words and sketches. And let's not forget the wavy hair along the side of her face. Blocks of pattern are a dominant feature on Greek geometric vases of the eighth century. All of it is abstract patterns within patterns precisely executed by the ancient painter. That precision is also what we see in the blocks of black and white patterns throughout Ruby's paintings. The detail of the frontal figure's head not only reveals sketches and patterns beneath the paint, but hair that falls in wavy strands along the side of the face. This hair and its texture, 
a theme in many of her paintings and sculptures, has a particular resonance leading us to the function of hair, especially for females in ancient Athenian society. Two examples here from the late sixth century BCE preserve the richly waving locks of hair or wavy locks of hair around the face and falling down to the shoulders. From my research, I have found it's almost impossible to find a female representation in Greek art with straight hair. The norm was hair with texture from wavy to very tightly coiled. Elaborate emphasis on thick long hair was a distinctive feature of maidens in Greek art. They were at the peak of their beauty and they were ready to get married. Dedications such as these two figures dotted the Athenian Acropolis which was sacred to with Athena, as well as other deities. Frontal figure with a pot is one of several variations of female figures within the exhibition. Here we are looking at another example, warm gemstones bust. My main point here is to draw your attention with the arrow to an area on her left chest, which we will see in detail. The detail is now on the left of the, of the slide, and in it are a series of designs drawn or written in pencil or graphite. Below the green horizontal band, at far left, we have an ivy band, something one might find on many Greek vases. At right, a series of palmettes that you see just above the pink shape. These palmettes are similar to what you see on the vase at the right. These palmette patterns re remain popular for about 200 years in Greek uh, uh, vase painting. A variation of the pattern was carved in stone for architectural ornamentation. Directly above the Greek horizontal band, upside down is the date January 21, 2020. Something that gives immediacy to the work, Ruby's time and place, her visceral presence within the work itself. As one of my students said yesterday, the date January 21, 2020 is uncanny because it's around the time when the coronavirus, COVID-19, started reaching global attention. In ancient Athens, the beauty of boys and men was celebrated by writing on a vase. So-and-so is kalos or beautiful. In this detail from a Pyxis or jar attributed to the Penthesilea painter in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we see young Paris learning that he must judge which among three goddesses is the most beautiful. As a mortal, he knew this judgment would be highly problematic. Directly above the head of Paris, you can see Greek letters referring to a boy as beautiful. Paris and the goddesses live in some kind of a mythological realm that is timeless. In contrast, the vase painter is alerting us to one of his contemporaries who was being celebrated in Athenian society. Today we have social media to publicize comments of which there are a profusion in ancient Athens, the surface, the surface of a vase offered opportunity to communicate contemporary or popular trends. Ruby's graphite outlines of figures in many of her paintings are partly visible and they recall Athenian white ground lekothoi, such as this vessel in detail here. The background is white. The figures are drawn in black glaze before the firing process, whereas vibrant colors for clothing were added after the vessel had been fired. This poses a problem. 
The pigments did not have durability, often fading or leaching into the earth. The clothing seems to disappear, but we will still see the contour lines of the figure, as here with the young man extending his right arm. In these last slides, I would like to highlight some general connections between classical or ancient Greek art and the work of Ruby Sky Styler. These two Greek vases were made about 260 years apart. The Dipolon Masters Amphora on the left in Athens is composed of a multitude of horizontal bands, most of which are filled with a rich variety of abstract patterns. The human figures, in a morning scene between the handles, present the body in a black silhouette. Nearly every inch of the surface of is covered, with each area inviting the viewer to look more closely. The kithara player on an amphora attributed to the Berlin player, player at excuse me, the Berlin painter at right, is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it reflects an opposite goal, how much can be eliminated. Surface decoration is gone. The musician does not even have a firm ground line to stand on. Nevertheless, we will place it there with our imagination. The musician is singing with his head rocked back, swaying with the music of his kithara. Contests were held for musicians, often in association with athletic games. Although he appears, appears to be flat on the surface, look carefully. And when you see the cloth cover hanging below the kithara, suddenly you see it, oh my gosh, it flipped over. So we have an artist who we call the Berlin painter affirming that the young man actually occupies space. He's three-dimensional. Ruby's work presents a related contrast or tension. Figure with a pot reveals a rich visual language that is both contemporary and filled with fragments alluding to a much earlier time in ancient Greece. Her vase with sienna handles or amphora is a contemporary distillation of a specific Greek vessel, one that is suffused with an ancient classical tradition. I wonder what ancient, what uh, an ancient Greek vase painter or potter might think of her work. I think they would love it. While this is a brief exploration of the classical influence in the work of Ruby Sky Styler, I would like to leave you with one more thought. The classical shapes and motifs forming Ruby's work and visual language embody another aspect. The movement of her hands in creating these works are the same movements made by ancient Greek artists 2,500 years ago. Thank you very much. I look forward to responding to your questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Schwab, for that wonderfully stimulating look into Ruby's work. And I'm waiting to see in the chat if we have any questions coming through from our audience, which, as Dr. Schwab said, covers everything from the West Coast to apparently a significant night owl staying up in Greece, just for the pleasure of hearing more about this. And I, while we wait for that, I will start off with my own question, which is if you had to recommend one piece of ancient sculpture or other artwork that you don't think that Ruby has yet drawn upon for an artwork, what would you recommend? What would I recommend? Hmm. Maybe one your, your students would be interested in. Well, I think that, and Ruby and I have discussed this, Ruby needs to go to Greece. And I have a feeling, and there are two things happening here. I think that there will probably be a significant audience for to see her work. So I do think that exhibiting in, in Greece, in Athens, which has a very dynamic contemporary art scene, 
would be quite exciting to pursue. And I hope something uh, comes of it. Uh, the, I would love to see Ruby's expression as she walks through the Acropolis Museum. And I think that she would likely see so much there that it would be almost overwhelming, but at the same time, magnificent. Uh, Ruby and I, a couple of years ago, strolled through the Greek and Roman galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was fantastic. Uh, what she sees, what I see, of course it's different. And yet we were learning so much from each other. Uh, we seem to be in a conversation that started in 2014 and I don't see any conclusion to it. So um, it's really something I, and I want to emphasize that I learned quite a bit from her uh, in what she sees. I love talking to artists who see and get excited about ancient Greek art. What they do with it, of course, is always radically different. And um, so I, there are many things I think Ruby will be exploring all kinds of exciting shapes and ideas, not just related to the ancient Greek world, but I can't wait to continue and follow her, the arc of her career. And we have a question coming through in the chat from someone who was asking, um, how many times have you been to Greece? Oh my. Well, I go every year and I studied there for my junior year, the full year. That was the beginning um, back in the Jurassic period. Uh, so I had an incredible experience and with that, and then I was able to return a few years later, and then again a few years later. But at this point, I go back every year, so I have frankly lost count how many times I've, I've been there. Understandably, it has to fit with the academic year here. And so for um, quite a period, I only went during spring recess. And uh, in the last years, I've been going right after commencement, and spending about three and a half weeks uh, to not only spend time with my own research project on the metopes of the Parthenon, and I study and draw the ones that are in the Acropolis Museum, but to always explore more. So I'm always excited to see more of Greece. And one thing I found interesting uh, in the conversation that Ruby had with um, Ian Barry, the curator, on the opening evening, was just she mentioned that the real kickoff of her interest in the ancient world was not Greece, as you mentioned, she has yet to travel there, but actually Pompeii. I know. And, and I wonder, you know, as you look at her art, obviously you're looking at it as a specialist in ancient Greek art. Have you seen anything of the Roman world that you think is distinct? Or do you think she was completely seduced by Greece after that initial encounter in, in Italy? Well, she probably could chime in and help us out here. Um, I, you know, I have no idea. The, um, it seems, I mean, it's pretty explicit, for example, that vase covered with images from Greek vases, uh, that is very distinct and that's very Greek in its essence. Um, but I think that, you know, that there are a lot of the letters uh, that show up in her works on the wall have evoke inscriptions that one would find in a Greek and Roman world. I mean, that's a much larger, larger um, description or geography. And of course we know there's an abundance that come from Pompeii. So there, there are all kinds of things. And I, um, I think she has also uh, looked into fresco wall painting and that might be somewhat inspired by um, that earlier visit to Pompeii. I don't know, um, but that's something that we can find out. Yeah. Well, between plaster casts, relief sculpture in her Aldrich show, we have painting, we have sculpture. I'm trying to imagine what are the other arts of the ancient world that she has not yet tapped. So perhaps numismatics is next on the list, which actually ties into, we have another question from a student asking, what do you think will be Ruby Styler's next inspiration for her work? So I guess wondering if you have a, a secret line in on where Ruby's going next. I don't, I don't, I honestly, I don't know because she's always several jumps ahead of all of us. Um, and 
I mean, it would be fascinating for her to look at coins and what she might do with them. Uh, some of the heads uh, reducing to their essence could be could could be inspired by, connected to coins. We have some beautiful loans from the American Numismatic Society. And of course we had some spectacular coins from the same organization lent for our hair in the classical world. And some of these coins are very big. So when students are listening and they're wondering what, you know, the size of a dime, I'm like, no, sort of a half dollar or a silver dollar, if you know what that looks like. These are big and they're much thicker. So there's a lot of pure metal, uh, precious metal involved. So um, there's that side, glass making is another whole thing, mosaic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it. Ruby's done a lot and um, it's just fascinating to see what she looks at and where she goes from there. Well, thank you, Dr. Schaub. I think we are almost out of time. I wanted to remind anyone who's watching for FYE credit to get a snapshot of the live chat and send that to museum at fairfield.edu. And for those of you who are part of the university community, unfortunately with the coronavirus, we are not able to open the museum to the wider public, but for those who are faculty, students, and staff, you can come to the Walsh Gallery and see Ruby's work and take advantage of what Dr. Schwab has told us this evening. We're open Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So with that, I would like to thank Dr. Katherine Schwab for her wonderful talk this evening and bid you all a happy evening. See you next time.